Well, welcome everybody to this evening's webinar. We're really excited, as you've heard, to be doing this. Um, our webinars, what we've done in the past is we've talked about different topics every every uh, month. But what we're going to do in this final webinar is a recap of everything that we've gone over uh, each month. So in January, we talked a wee bit about growing horses. In February, we touched on calming supplements. In March, we were lucky enough to have a guest speaker from Kemen talk about some of the products that we include in our DAC line. Um, April, this is always a good one. I literally go through the catalog and um, page by page talk about each of the products in the catalog. Um, in May, we touched on joint health. June, well, it's hot in June, so we talked about the heat and keeping your horses cool and uh, electrolytes. July, there was an equine science meeting that we have every two years, and this year it was virtual, uh, so I did a recap of that. August, we took a break. We had been busting, and everybody had been working so hard and getting on these webinars, so we took a break in August. Back in um, October, we talked about winter feeding and bloom, and in November, we talked about uh, brood mares and feeding brood mares. We touched on putting them under lights and, and that kind of thing. So let's go right ahead and talk about growing horses, because we're right around to having to talk about growing horses again. Um, Fall feeding is what we started with, and we were talking about early gestation and how important it is, really how important it is to feed those mares during their, their pregnancy. Um, it's most important, even before they go to the breeding shed, to have them on a good basic vitamin and mineral supplement. But so much is occurring in the growth of that foal in utero in those first six months. So early embryonic loss um, is, is very important in those first 40 days. Um, we don't want to change the feed. We don't want to change the environment. We want to keep everything as um, the same as possible. So whatever you want your mare to be eating after she's pregnant, you should really get her adapted to that before she's pregnant. Um, but as you can see from these graphics here, by day 18 to 20, we have heart development heart is a really critical organ and we know that zinc and copper and vitamin A and vitamin D are really critical in those early, early, early days. Um, when we look into mid gestation, we're looking at that seventh and eighth month. And by this point, we certainly are increasing our energy and protein requirement. Um, but vitamins and minerals are still absolutely critical for that fetal development. We have pretty much all of the limb development. It's all cartilaginous, but it's all developed by the second trimester. You can see here the liver, the heart, the kidney, brain, lung, bone, and all the minerals and vitamins that are required in order to um, develop those, those organs. And, uh, and these, in, the copper, the zinc, the selenium, the iron, these are over and over again, calcium, magnesium. These are the the foundational minerals in the Breeders' Choice Plus, in the Colt Grower, and all of our uh, pro products that are uh, developed for broodmares and growing horses. By late gestation, we're looking at 9th, 10th, and 11th month. We certainly have a lot of uh, extra muscle and tissue being developed. So if you look at ultrasounds uh, of the actual fetus and you weigh your mare during these times, you can see that she has significant weight gain because we have a lot of, it's about a pound a day of, of fetal growth, um, but we're, we're just laying down tissue and fat. All of the, the critical organs and limbs are already development developed. The other thing the mare is doing is fortifying the fetal liver. So her milk is not very high in mineral content, but what she'll do is across the placental barrier, um, fortify that fetal liver with um, vitamins and minerals so that once the foal is born, it's going to tap into those liver stores. So a common question I get is, when do I start feeding? Uh, when should I be supplementing my foal or starting to feed my foal? Um, well, we notice that the 
the milk production curve really starts to drop off um, at about between the two and three months. And really by the end of three months, we've, we've really decreased the milk production. And that's when foals would naturally just start eating themselves. So we say about three months is when we should be starting to supplement. If you have foals that you're worried about joint problems, developmental orthopedic disease, OCDs, then you should definitely start supplementing them around 30 days of age with something like the cult grower. Get them to eat it out of your hand, maybe on some uh, hay pellets. I'll be able to cut this out, but if everybody could mute themselves so we can't hear people coughing and that kind of thing, that would be fantastic. I don't seem to be able to mute everybody on my end. So we know that there are a lot of causes uh, for the developmental orthopedic diseases that um, falls will develop. We know that excess energy without adequate protein, uh, copper deficiency, excess zinc, uneven calcium phosphorus ratio, um, lack of selenium, these all play into uh, falls developing, de poorly growing and developing issues. We have included into the cult grower uh, an ingredient called calcite, and it is a marine derived form of calcium. Um, and it's it's actually got several other minerals in it, but its primary ingredient is calcium. And when you look at it under a microscope, it is a honeycomb structure. So it's very highly bioavailable um, and it's exceptional at buffering stomach acid. So we've also incorporated it in other gastrointestinal products, but as far as bone density, um, sub research looking at including calcite into uh, growing horse supplements, significantly these red bars are the supplemented horses versus the blue bars are the control. And you can see at 30 and 90 days of age uh, on treatment, these foals had significantly higher bone density. So it really is exceptional. So there are multiple things that we recommend with a foal that may be suffering from some kind of growth disorder. Um, weaning them early so that you can 100% control their intake, what they're consuming, uh, reducing the energy content. Uh, we're not necessarily slowing the growth, but we don't want a lot of extra calories that they'll just lay down as fat and get too heavy. We need to really analyze the diet and making sure that they're getting all of the vitamins and minerals that they need. Potentially stall rest to prevent any ex extra damage that they might do. When it comes to maintaining correct pro vitamins and minerals, the DAC orange, the cult grower, um, CMZ paste if we actually have some issues. Now, I haven't really talked about this, but if the mare is not lactating well, um, then we can use a product like the DAC metabolic, which is high in chromium, which can improve her milk production as well. In February, we switched gears and we started talking about calming supplements. Um, and I really first like to talk about, like to ask a bunch of questions um, because I think that very few horses are just crazy. Uh, and nine times out of 10, there's something else going on in the horse's life that we need to address. So am I overfeeding the horse? Am I feeding a grain that is too high in energy for the amount of exercise that, that I'm giving them? Am I exercising them enough? Is there enough fiber in the diet or are they getting too much sugar and starch? Is the horse spending too much time in the stall and not enough being turned out? Is the barn environment stressful? Is there loud music? Are there people cleaning the barn? while my horse is in there and it really stresses them out. Is their behavior due to pain? Is the saddle or bridle not fitting well? Is there a hoof issue? Is there a muscle issue? Is there a gut issue? Um, are the teeth painful for the horse? Is this a new behavior? Or was there something else that changed at the same time? Did the weather change? Did you move their pasture buddies? Did you move their turnout paddock? Have they moved to a different stall? Are they losing weight? Is it a mare and it is seasonal? 
Um, are, are there certain times of the year uh, or day that the horse is different? Is it just when you go to shows or is it when you're home as well? And all these questions need to be asked before you really can um, evaluate the whole program and how to fully address uh, altering the horse's behavior. In our line, we have the Calm B paste, the Calm B powder as our calming supplements. But then I also recommend, okay, nine times out of 10, it's a pain response. So is it gut pain? Should we be looking at cool gut for stomach and hindgut pain? Um, is there some inflammation in the joint from just general wear and tear? Have we just started the horse? Should we be looking at QHA plus to help with some of that joint pain? The yucca five way. Yucca is a mild anti-inflammatory. The herbal respond. Optimum Flex Plus, if we think it might be some osteoarthritis or DHA Perform will also decrease inflammation because of those omega-3 fatty acids. In March, we were fortunate enough to have a guest speaker, Michael Eggleston from Kemen Equine. And Kemen is a biotech company, one of the partners that we work with. And they have several products that we utilize in our DAC line, several ingredients. Um, do the, does any of these sound familiar? We've got gastric ulcers or co colonic ulcer symptoms where we have chronic diarrhea. Maybe the horse has a dull coat, poor hoof quality and nothing seems to be working. We've tried all the hoof supplements and nothing's working. Does the horse have allergy-like symptoms? Um, and when you look at the allergy panel, it seems like he's allergic to life itself. And how on earth is the horse surviving? Do you put them on a, a, a gastric ulcer medicine? And it seems to get a little better, but as soon as you wean them off it, it re immediately comes back. Do they have strong erratic behavior? And chronic diarrhea is also another uh, sign. The, these are a lot of these symptoms are things that we. Um, deal with with our clients on a daily basis. Well, if we look inside the gut lining, we're talking about the hind gut now, there are little fingers, we call them villi, that line the intestine and really just increases the surface area so that we can absorb more nutrients. But between those cells that line the intestinal wall that have the little fingers on them, there are these things called tight junctions, and it's really like Velcro. And unfortunately, what happens is when horses get stressed for any number of different reasons, horses get stressed from air, anything imaginable, um, though we know that stress and the hormones that are secreted when the horse is chronically stressed um, can interfere with those tight junctions, those Velcros, and everybody's had a, a Velcro that's worn out and it just won't stick anymore. And so what we then have is undigested food particles and toxins and bacteria floating into the bloodstream causing this uh, chronic inflammation and that's really the root of all bad things. So this is a nice healthy gut. You can see those Velcros, those tight junctions are nicely closed. And then we actually absorb through the cell uh, the, the right way, but undigested food is not floating through. But then we have this issue with leaky gut where the horse is stressed and those Velcros are broken and we have this non-digested food particles floating into the intest, into the bloodstream, causing all kinds of problems. Um, I mentioned that horses get stressed by any number of things, whether it be heat stress because it's the middle of summer and that's when we all see our horses, exercise, training, hauling. Um, Psychological stress is a big thing. So you took the horse's buddy away um, and they're really stressed by that. That is a real thing. Psychological stress is a real thing in horses just like it is in people. Um, are they locked in stalls and they haven't been used to stalls before? Changing the forage, just changing the hay can hugely stress horses out. Um, excess grain in the diet, mycotoxins. Um, it can be, you came out and fed your horse at a different time. They're used to you coming at six o'clock and you came at seven o'clock. That can be enough to stress the horse. Um, so all of these things, plus 
any number of other things can stress the horse out and can cause this leaky gut issue. Um, we know that you know, if we go back and, and look at that, remember that picture I just showed you with the tight junctions in between those Velcros, we know that zinc, the, the mineral zinc, plays a huge role in the health of those intestinal cells and of those Velcros in between the cells. We also know that the bacteria that live in the hindgut of the horse that break down all the food, they create a volatile fatty acid called butyrate. And butyrate also helps to feed those intestinal cells and keeps them healthy. Just like we need oxygen and water and we need sugars and starches ourselves and glucose to, to stay alive, these cells feed on butyrate and that's what heals them. So we utilize a product called Butyrpearl Z in our rescue aid paste that really helps to heal those tight junctions, those Velcros in the hindgut. And as I mentioned, we use that in the rescue aid paste. Um, we also are utilizing chromium, uh, another product from Kemen. They There are a variety of different chromium sources that have been available on the market for a while. But as of March last year, this was the first FDA approved chromium on the market for horses. It has 20 years of research, over 50 peer reviews, research papers. It's really, really important for those horses that have metabolic issues, as well as for performance. Registered in over 35 countries, as I mentioned, it's the first chromium approved for F by the FDA for use in horses. Um, and the way I describe kind of glucose and insulin, because that's really where chromium works, is you eat food and it gets broken down into glucose, and that's floating around in your blood, and insulin is a taxi and it drives glucose across the intestinal border and drops it off in the bloodstream and then the blood carries it away in order to do its job. Well, we know in our horses that have metabolic issues, metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, the taxi's broken. So the glucose has no way of getting through into the bloodstream. What chromium will do is it will fix those broken insulin receptors, those broken insulin taxis, for lack of a better word, and it will allow that insulin then to drive glucose across the border and into the bloodstream so that it can go off and do its job. Anyone who's had a horse with laminitis or insulin resistance knows that when the blood, the vet comes and takes a blood sample, they'll see high glucose and insulin levels in the blood, which is because it has nowhere to go. The insulin is broken, the glucose has nowhere to go and it's just floating around um, and we want to get it out into the bloodstream and off off into the muscle cell and off to be utilized. We know that uh, during low intensity exercise, so we're just walking, trotting, most of the energy that is supplied for the horse, we have a high proportion of energy comes from fat. So the DAC oil, if you're doing uh, kind of long, slow exercise or nothing done at speed, then feeding fat in the form of something like DAC oil is really beneficial. As you increase the amount, uh, the intensity and the speed of the exercise, less of the, ener less of the, the nutrients that are used for that speed uh, come from fat and more is coming from those sugars and starches. So we know that because chromium it in the insulin resistant horse, it will fix those broken insulin receptors. In the horse that has no issues but is doing high level performance, then if we can allow more glucose to get into the muscle and be utilized, um, then by rights, it should be able to go faster and be healthier. So um, chromium is in our e-boost paste, which replaces our old race booster paste. This is the e-boost paste. Um, we've had a lot of success in horses um, doing exercise at speed, barrel racing horses, um, race horses using the e-boost paste. We also know that stress in animals, one of the hormones that is released is cortisol. Um, and we know that cortisol can be 
damaging to the body. It's, it's one of those uh, stress markers. And when we feed um, chromium to the horse, it can help to mitigate some of those that, that cortisol release. So I always say that we might want our horse to run faster or jump higher or you know perform in a certain way. But internally, the horse is going to prioritize living and being healthy first. So a lot of times we don't see the horse's stress or we can't see the horse's immune system. And by adding something like chromium and allowing the animal to have more energy available to mitigate stress or feed the immune system, then they're also going to have more energy for the performance, the speed, the, um, the things that we want it to do. Uh, I mentioned earlier about uh, brood mares and potentially increasing milk production. Chromium has been used in the dairy industry for a very long time for that very reason, to increase milk production because what fuels milk production, it's glucose. Uh, and so if we can get more glucose into the system, then we can produce more milk. So if you do have a mare um, that is struggling with milk production, we have used the DAC metabolic um, uh, successfully. In April, we went through the catalog. Um, and the best way, if you don't have a catalog or you've misplaced your catalog, it's very easy. You just go on the website and right here, I've circled it in red, it says current DAC catalog. That's actually a hyperlink. You can click on that and it will take you to this fancy little flip catalog where you just click the pages and your catalog is right there. If you didn't have one and you want to pull this up on your phone and we went page by page and looked at all of the products, the new products, old products, old products in the catalog. This was a new catalog for 2021. It included some of the new products, the eBoost paste, the Cool Gut, uh, the, um, sorry, I should say the, the pre-buff, the DAC metabolic, and some layout was slightly different. So it was great to be able to go through the, the catalog that way. In May, we touched on joints, joint health um, and joint supplements. And we know that there are so many joint supplements out there, and it's probably one of the most common questions that I get is about joint health and which joint supplement can I use? Uh, when do I use the joint supplements? Uh, when do I use hyaluronic acid, uh, the LQHA plus over the um, Optimum Flex or what can I use? So really we, we have to understand the basis of the uh, joints and the different types of joints before we get into that. So there are about 205 bones in the horse's skeleton. 20 of these bones are in each foreleg and 20 in each hind limb for a grand total of 80 bones in the four equine legs. There are three types of joints. There's the cartilaginous joint. So if you imagine one example might be the, the connective tissue between the vertebrae, um, that, that's a cartilaginous joint. It doesn't really flex a whole lot. It's got some flexion. Um, then there are fibrous uh, joints. They really don't flex at all. And so your skull, your head is made up of multiple plates, but there's not a lot of movement, very minute movement between those skull plates. Um, and that's a fibrous joint between those skull plates. And then we have the synovial joints, which is pretty much the joint that we direct our joint supplements towards. Um, an example of that would be the knee. The, these are the key synovial fluent joints in the stifle, the hock, the fetlock, uh, the knee, the pastin. These are the synovial joints. And uh, you can orient yourself to it. So in the middle of that joint, we've got the two bones, right? We've got the two um, bones. And then on the end, we have that articular cartilage, which acts as a sponge and a shock absorber. Uh, in the dark green in the very middle, that's the synovial fluid. Some people call it the joint fluid. And it's very viscous and thick and sticky, and it holds everything. Um, 
it's kind of like the oil in your ball bearings in your in your truck and it stops friction and wear and tear against the the ends of those that joint now right around that we have the synovial membrane that's that dark kind of golden color and then around that is the joint capsule and that all holds holds all that fluid in to the joint and it's not meant to leak out and if we get in, inflammation in any part any part of that then that can be quite detrimental and that really is the first uh step in joint disease so joint Hang damage up. can be categorized Thanks, Stephen, for a minute. yes check your messages i just listed winners for the first round of winners oh fantastic uh first round of winners before we go any further we have diane stafford jen hickey linda colette and Teresa reed um how do you want them to contact you uh email me their size um and address and i'll put my email in the messages perfect perfect okay um, joint damage can be categorized, as I mentioned, into these th distinct stages. We've got synovitis, capsulitis, um, degenerative joint disease, and then osteoarthritis. And the, anything with an itis is just inflammation. So we've got inflammation of um, that synovial membrane. Right here, we've either got inflammation here in this synovial membrane or of this joint capsule and that's uh, synovitis or capsulitis De degenerative joint disease say that fast three times um, and now we start to see some breakdown of that cartilage and then osteoarthritis we've got a total breakdown of that joint um, we know that there are a multitude of ingredients that are important in the um, in a joint supplement. We don't just want to have glucosamine. We don't just want to have MSN or chondroitin. In a horse with osteoarthritis, we want to have a complete joint supplement that has glucosamine and this does have equine research um, because they all do different things within the joint. So glucosamine will support cartilage production, improve some joint comfort, uh, inhibit some of those inflammatory mediators. Uh, chondroitin sulfate also supports the production and slows the breakdown of cartilage, um, inhibits those in, in inflammatory mediators. And glucosamine and chondroitin really work very well together. Equine MSM, um, again, a proposed anti-inflammatory and again, equine research. Um, hyaluronic acid is uh, liquid hyaluronic acid. We've got hyaluronic acid in the Optimum Flex Plus, but we also have it in uh, a standalone product, the um, LQHA Plus. Now it comes in a quart or a gallon size, and we originally were only selling the Optimum Flex Plus. And, and I would have, a couple of years ago, said that. I did not recommend um, joint supplements for young growing horses. But after the research has come out, um, we really do see that um, in the young growing horse, hyaluronic acid particularly can be very beneficial um, for keeping that uh, synovial fluid and the joint capsule and the synovial membrane um, strong and healthy uh, the synovial fluid actually contains three to four milligrams per mil of hyaluronic acid so hyaluronic acid is a key ingredient in that um, uh, synovial fluid so uh, those young horses that are starting their exercise um, those those animals are the ones that i really do recommend be fed the lqha plus it's not until they're older and we know that they've probably got some joint degeneration that I recommend they go on Optimum Flex Plus. But any any young horse that has started maybe a little stiff or sore or you're, you know you're going to put a lot of exercise on them, 
then I definitely recommend the LQHA+. Plus. Um, research showed that used prior to an inflammatory event, the, the hyaluronic acid in this liquid form had a protective uh, effect on the cells and decreased inflammation. So decreasing that synovitis and capsulitis, which is what we see mainly in these younger animals. Um, so the Optimum Flex Plus for those older horses, blend of chondroitin, glucosamine, hyaluronic acid, MSM, and vitamin E, C to support the joint health and alleviate inflammation. The LQHA Plus to increase joint synovial fluid and for those younger horses. And then Herbal Respond, uh, a more economical choice if we're just looking for some anti-inflammatory properties. Maybe we've got an older senior horse that isn't doing any exercise anymore and the Optimum Flex is in your budget. Um, or a young horse that you may be going through some growing pains and you might, might want to try some herbal respond. In June, it was starting to get hot and we talked about heat stress and electrolytes. Um, what are some signs of heat stress? Well, the horse's breathing rate higher than heart rate or faster than 60 breaths per minute, reduced feed or water intake, rectal temperature above 103 degrees Fahrenheit, increased heart rate, profuse sweating, or the worst case scenario is your horse was profusely sweating and then all of a sudden they just stopped sweating. That is the worst case scenario because that is the best way that they can dissipate heat and if they stop sweating, is bad news. Droopy ears, restless, lethargic, depressed amina, dehydration, skin tent. When you pinch the skin into a tent, it lasts several seconds after pinching the skin of the neck or shoulders. Um, muscle cramping, colic-like symptoms, or you can even do the capillary refill time where you lift up the top lip and stick your thumb on it and press. And if you don't see the blood return back to that thumbprint within a couple of seconds, then we know that the horse is um, dehydrated. But one thing that I say often, whether it was, is with how much water your horse is drinking or um, the temperature of your horse and or how much is the, are they sweating, is you need to know what is normal for your horse. So you need to document what is my horse's normal rectal temperature um, in the wintertime and in the summertime? And what is my horse's normal rectal temperature after I've ridden them both in the winter and in the summer? Um, what is my horse's normal resting heart rate? And what is their normal heart rate after I've ridden them? So that you know when it is abnormal. Okay, before we go any further, we have some more winners. We have Mitch Adkins, Nicole Spots, Steph Lawrence, and Sally Lawrence Reynolds. Please message Tina your um, shirt size, mailing address, your name, and email that to tina at feedback.com. So horses are at higher risk of heat stress if they're poorly conditioned. So your um, exercising them too much for their level of conditioning. Um, if you, if they're overweight, if they're older, if they have no shade available, um, poorly ventilated stalls or trailers, heavily muscled horses, um, or they're not acclimated to the warmer temperatures. All of these animals are at much higher risk of heat stress. Um, now, the main ways that horses will dissipate heat is by maximizing blood flow to the skin, right? So the blood is carrying all that heat, and if they get it close to the surface, it'll help disperse heat because we're going to sweat, and that's go and then the evaporative cooling, we're going to, the outside air is going to, um, evaporate that that sweat and it's going to cool them down. Um, breathing rapidly will also eliminate about 15% of the heat load, but sweating will eliminate about 70% of the heat load. So if your horse stops sweating, they are not able to dissipate that heat. So it's really, really important <clears throat> that you do not get to that point. We want to make sure that we're hosing horses and you don't need to scrape the water off. And people say, oh, but I've always been told you need to scrape the water off. And if you don't scrape the water off, the, the water will boil on them and they'll get hot. Um, here's a little trick. 
get out of the shower, don't towel off, and turn a fan on. You will be freezing. And then the next time, get out of the shower, towel off, and then turn the fan on. You'll still be cold, but you won't be freezing. Um, so we know that when the horse's temperature gets to above 106 degrees Fahrenheit, that's heat stroke. 103, we're really overheating. 101 to 103 is normal during exercise, but under 100 degrees Fahrenheit is normal for just standing. Again, what is normal for your horse? We know though that we have this heat index and if the temperature is and the humidity score, so we add the outside temperature, outside temperature in Fahrenheit and the relative humidity, if we add those two together, the number that we get, that is what we call the heat index. And so if it's 130 degree, 130 heat index or less, we have no, no issues at all. Um, and so an example of that would be if it was 88 degrees Fahrenheit outside with 45% humidity, we have a total score of 133. So we're just into the medium risk. Um, 150 to 180, we're in the high risk. Greater than 180, don't ride your horse. Make sure you're doing things to cool them even when they're, um, when they're just in their stall. When cooling, you immediately move them to the shade, provide fresh water, an electrolyte, um, increase airflow, use a fan, spray the head, back, neck, rump, legs with cool water. You can place, place ice packs over the jugular vein because that's where we've got a lot of um, blood pumping. Call your veterinarian if your horse's temperature stays above 103 degrees Fahrenheit. But I remember when I did this webinar, what I recommended is, you know what's normal for your horse. If you think your horse might be in a heat stress situation in, oh, it's 103 degrees, call your vet and say, my horse may be in a heat stress situation. It's 103 and I'm monitoring so that they are aware of the situation. because. If you say, if you don't call them until two hours into your monitoring and your horse is still at 103 degrees or it's gone up, your vet can't get there immediately. Most vets are out busy. They might be an hour away and you don't have an hour. So give everybody um, an amount of time so that they know, so that they're aware of the situation. Continue to monitor your horse over the next few days because colic and laminitis can develop as well. Um, Another, uh, I mentioned the chromium being in the eBoost paste and in the racing formula, as well as in the DAC metabolic. Um, and some research done in pigs. Now, stress, I mentioned cortisol being high and being a measure of stress in animals. Heat stress is a really big problem in pigs, especially in those feedlots. So the research was done feeding chromium to those pigs, either in a what we call a thermoneutral environment, so no heat stress at all, that was the yellow line. And then we've got the, the orange line, which is solid, that's the heat stress with no chromium added. And then we have the dashed orange line is heat stress with chromium added. Okay, and you can see that the temperature, the rectal temperature and the respiration rate in the heat stressed animals that are fed chromium is significantly less than those that were not fed chromium. So adding racing formula um, along with your electrolytes when you're doing um, high level exercise is, is beneficial. It's going to help with heat stress. If you don't do racing formula and you know that you're riding in hot environments and you're worried about heat stress, add the DAC metabolic. Um, we, we primarily market that towards horses with metabolic issues, but we know that chromium has a whole slew of other different uses metabolically in the animal. So <clears throat> using the, uh, the chromium that's in the DAC metabolic in heat stress situations is also a great idea. So we have one more t-shirt giveaway. We have Carrie Coffee and Tasha Winterfield. Tasha Winterfield, please 
message Tina. So we've got the chemtrace chromium in the racing formula, the e-boost paste, and in the DAC metabolic. Electrolytes, uh, well, we mentioned that the process of sweating decreases that core temperature through evaporative cooling. 70% of the horse's ability to cool themselves is through sweating. But when they do that, they're losing major electrolytes, sodium, chloride, potassium, calcium, magnesium. And we'll see muscle cramps. They'll get uncoordinated. In people, we see um, brain fog, brain function um, starts to be impaired. Supplement electrolytes shortly before, during, and after exercise. Um, do not add it to the water bucket because if they don't really like the taste of it, um, they're not drinking a five gallons of water immediately. Um, sodium and chloride should be the primary ingredients, not sugar. The problem with sugar in an electrolyte is that it will actually block the uptake of some of those electrolyte salts. Um, so we really don't want to uh, add sugar. Supplements daily during work, discontinued during training breaks, breaks, unless it's very hot weather and the horse is sweating a lot. Now, the one other thing is horses do sweat in the wintertime when you're riding them. The environment is very dry, so oftentimes we don't see the sweat. But if you are actively riding your horse in the wintertime, please do continue with your electrolyte. The DAC electrolyte has no um, sugar. Um, we have the electrolyte in the electrolyte paste, which is great. You could do that um, prior to an event or, or prior to a really hot day. And then we also have the powder if you want to be doing this daily. Okay, before we go on to July, uh, Tina has a couple more giveaways. Tina, do you want to unmute yourself? Okay. <clears throat> Randy has given me the approval to give away a couple gift cards. Um, our winner, uh, two winners of $50 gift cards this evening is Travis Blanchfield and Jessica Paquette. So please get with um, me, email me at Tina at and I will get those sent out to you. Awesome. Thank you, Tina. And thank you, Randy. I remember this happened on our last webinar too. Randy gets into the Christmas spirit and we should just call him Father Christmas during the webinar because he always comes up with these cool, cool gift ideas. So in July, we started to uh, do an overview of the equine science meeting. Um, we've been talking a lot about chromium propionate. I said it was FDA approved. This group of researchers at the University of North Carolina was part of that. The chemtrace uh, chromium FDA approved at four milligrams a day. And the study shows that it was safe and, if it, and it was efficate, it was effective. Um, so the first, first time we do studies on products, we wanna make sure that they're safe. And then the studies go further into, do they do anything? Um, and so, it, this just reinforced that it was very safe and it was doing something. Um, feeding stalled horses a diet high in omega-3 fatty acids results in plasma fatty acid profiles similar to those horses on pasture. Horses are not meant to live in stalls and they're not meant to eat grain. They're meant to be out and grazing and omega-3 fatty acids are really important. But we do know that the the most of the plant forms like the flax and chia and hemp that people will feed to horses aren't that available. Um, but this showed that feeding supplements high in omega-3 fatty acids like the DHA Perform, the Breeders Excel, even the oil can increase omega-3 fatty acids in plasma to levels seen in horses at pasture. It takes about 60 days to see that um, level of increase, uh, but that was really neat information to see. Then the marine-based marine, bar marine -based calcium, that calcite that I mentioned earlier that we put in the um, DAC cult grower that is going to improve bone density. Uh, before this research, we knew that it was very good at buffering stomach acid, but we didn't think it went much further than that. This research showed that that marine-derived calcium or calcite was very effective at buffering stomach acid, but also determined that 
the hindgut pH, so the cecum and large colon and small colon, where we have that hindgut acid and the hindgut ulcers and colitis, um, that the marine-derived calcium was actually effective at buffering that too. So we've got the cool gut and the pre-buff. The pre-buff is literally liquid calcite. That's all it is. Um, and we recommend that's instantaneous buffering. It's going to give instantaneous buffering to the stomach and to the hindgut. We recommend doing that prior to um, any stressful event. Again, back to the omega-3 fatty acid DHA, late gestation supplementation of that um, the DHA increases the full blood plasma concentrations at birth. Um, we know that maternal supplementation of omega-3 fatty acids during gestation has a variety of benefits on the dam and the offspring. Um, it decreases the time it takes for that foal to stand up and to suckle. It increases immune status at birth. And this particular sh study showed that feeding the dam, a marine-derived omega-3 fatty acid, um, like the DHA perform, in late gestation, significantly increased full plasma DHA more than your plant things, plant bases like flax or chia. So DHA perform and breeders excel are fantastic for doing that. Probiotic administration post foaling may reduce parasite shedding in foals. Um, if we can boost the hindgut microbiome, then we can increase the foals immunity and decrease their parasite load. So data from studies in humans and production animals has indicated that certain probiotics may interfere with the development of parasites. Um, so two days post foaling, two times a day, for eight days, they gave a probiotic and the study indicated that the administration of that probiotic paste um, to, in comparison to identically managed foals that did not have the probiotic pace, it significantly decreased their overall parasite load. And we know that those young animals are really susceptible to parasites. So the probiotic pace in young foals, as, as young as two days post falling, two times a day um, for eight days, significantly decreased their um, parasite load. So in August and September, we took a bit of a break. September, actually, we did frequently asked questions. Uh, and this is a good one. We typically go over this every year and I, I revive some of the questions that we continually get asked or um, there's always new questions that pop up. Um, first of all, we went over the conversions and don't worry, you don't have to write all this down. We will have these slides uh, available and this will be on YouTube um, for you to view. And if you want this particular slide so that you know how to make conversions, then you just get with your territory manager and get this to you. But um, the basic conversions that you need in order to be able to compare products, um, 16 ounces in a pound. PPMs or parts per million is exactly the same as milligrams per kilogram. Well, how do I get milligrams per kilogram to milligrams per pound? Well, you divide it by 2.2 and you get milligrams per pound. And then milligrams per pound, because I don't feed a pound, I only feed an ounce. Well, there are 16 ounces in a pound. So if you divide that milligrams per pound by 16, you get milligrams per ounces. Um, percent is always applied to an amount. So 5% means nothing. 100% means nothing. Um, it's of what? 5% selenium in one ounce or 15 ounces. Um, it, it's it's applied to an amount. So always, always, so my kind of analogy for that is 100% of 10 is 10. 10% 10 of 100 is also 10. 1% 1 of 1,000 is also 10. And 0.1% of 10,000 is also 10. So really the percentage meant nothing. It, it, it's what is it applied to? These are some of the common questions that I get. Um, what are the calories in DAC oil? It's 4.2 megacals per pound, and every oil is exactly the same. What is the omega-3 to 6 ratio in the DAC oil? Uh, it's one part omega-3 to 2.4 parts omega-6. What is in the DAC oil? Well, it's a pro pro proprietary blend of canola oil, flaxseed oil, wheat germ oil, a bit of fish oil to boost up the DHA, 
rice oil, D-alpha-tocopherol, which is natural vitamin E, which is a natural preservative, um, as well as citric acid as a pre preservative, and a little bit of caramel flavor. Um, people ask, well, how much flax is there? How much wheat germ? How much fish oil? I really can't disclose that because it's a proprietary blend. I hope you can all understand that. There's no soy in the DAC oil. Um, and again, uh, I can't say exactly how much canola and how much wheat germ, but do know that when you're reading a tag, um, ingredients are listed if, if the tag is written correctly, and I guarantee you that the DAC labels are written correctly, um, is ingredients are listed in order of inclusion. So the, the ingredient in the highest inclusion is canola followed by flax and wheat germ and all the way down. Um, I get asked a lot about, well, you know, I use oats or bloom or beet pulp for weight gain. Well, three and a half ounces of oil is equivalent in calories to one pound of alfalfa. Four and a half ounces of oil is equivalent to a pound of beet pulp. Five and a half ounces of oil is a, equivalent to the same amount of calories that you would get from a pound of oats. And seven and a half ounces of oil would be the same calories as a pound of bloom. So oil is the easiest go-to for weight gain. Most bang for your buck. Um, what kind of grain does DAC recommend? We don't really recommend any grain. Our products work with any concentrate you choose to feed. What's the shelf life of my DAC products? About 18 to 24 months if from date of manufacture, if stored under correct conditions. And what are those correct conditions? Out of direct sunlight, keep the container sealed, avoid extreme heat and cold, um, avoid damp, humid conditions. Ideally, we want to stay between that 40 to 50 percent humidity, free from rodent and insect contamination. Now, sometimes we buy in bulk so that we can get better deals, right? And so we have a 50 pound sack and we open it and we're using out of it. What I recommend if you do live in areas, let's say you live in Florida or California and it's all and it's humid and it's hot and you don't have a climate control feed room is that you might want to keep your big bag at home and in a in a climate controlled environment and just decant out of that into a bucket or a smaller container um, what you might be using for a couple of weeks at a time. Why are there different scoops? Um, products have different weights. It's like feathers versus rocks. It's it's down my picture on the bottom here. I've got a 12 pound um, bowling ball is exactly the same size as a one pound soccer ball. Uh, but we feed by weight, not by volume. So each product weighs a different amount. It has a different density. Anyone who's looked at the uh, DHA Perform, it's very fluffy compared to other products like the the um, orange superior and the cocoa are pretty dense. Why so many products, and not just one or two that do more things? Well, this is a this is a great one that I love because there are so many supplements out there that try to do everything in one to two ounces, and that is just physically impossible. I know that in order to have enough biotin in my joint supplement or hyaluronic acid. Uh, I should say biotin my host supplement or hyaluronic acid in my joint supplement, there are certain amounts of those ingredients that I need. And I'm starting to run out of my one to two ounces if I want it to be a go faster, jump higher, coat shiner, gut health, you know, tail grows longer, calming supplement. There's just no possible way to do it all. Um, so we have specific products that do specific things and they do them dang well. Uh, can I feed multiple DAC products at once? Yes, absolutely, except the vitamin and mineral supplements. So from the list here on the right-hand side, the Direct Action, Orange Superior, Breeders' Choice Plus, Colt Grower, Racing Formula, Total Performance, Total Performance Plus, and the Pasture Lick, you would only choose one of those products. Will it test? Uh, the Herbal Respond contains Devil's Claw, which is a USEF and FEI banned substance list. Um, if you're looking for pain mediation, you might try DHA Perform or the Yucca. Um, all of the products are safe to be fed uh, to pregnant mares, or, or I should say all of the products are safe to be fed prior to and during competition, except for the Herbal Respond. Uh, safe for my pregnant mare, 
do not feed herbal respond or the mare relieve to pregnant mares. As Randy mentioned, it was great to get back out. We've had we had had a year of being stuck inside, no competitions, no trade shows, no events, no meetings, and we really did start to see this year um, that open back up, and it was just great to um, see Dak back at the Quarter Horse Congress in October. Then we started to. I know October probably wasn't cold where you were, but we want to be prepared. And we started talking about winter feeding. And when we talk about winter feeding, there's this lower critical temperature. Like there's upper temperatures in the summertime. There's a lower critical temperature in the winter. We know that if we get below five, to, there's a range in older horses. In adult horses, there's a range between five degrees and 41 degrees. And it really depends on whether they have a thin coat or a thick coat. And any, if you get below that, it significantly increases the amount of food they have to eat just to maintain their body temperature is really what the lower critical temperature is. In younger horses, we have that range is from 12 to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. We know that for every degree we go below that lower critical temperature, it really increases the amount of energy the horse has to consume in order to just maintain their body temperature. So let's say... Um, we have a, a thoroughbred with a real thin, beautiful, shiny coat. Um, his lower critical temperature would be about 10 degrees, uh, would be 41 degrees Fahrenheit. So let's say the outside temperature is 31 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, he has to eat an extra two pounds of um, really good quality hay a day. And we get to a point where if it gets really, really cold, he's just not going to be able to eat enough extra food to maintain his body temperature. Especially if we get rain and wind, you know, if it's 32 degrees Fahrenheit out there and it's raining and windy, we're increasing our energy requirements by about 10 to 14 megacals per day. So with a really good quality hay, that's about one megacal per pound. We're looking at adding about 10 to 14 pounds of hay a day on top of what they were already eating. There's just no way to do that. So um, adding high calorie ingredients like the oil can help give them calories without a lot of extra bulk. Um, we know that something that worries people over the winter time is the amount of hay. Um, how am I going to store it all? How am I going to get it all? How much do I need? I always say that fear is the unknown, right? And so if you just know you can prepare so for a five months, about 150 days, I've worked out that one horse eating a conservative amount of hay, one and a half percent of their body weight, is going to need uh, a, just a hair over a ton. So if you're feeding the East Coast 40-pound bales, you're looking at about 60 bales per horse. That gives you a bit of an idea. Um, thin horse feeding is a big problem in the wintertime. We have a lot of horses that come out of the winter and they're really thin. And so again, oil is your best bet for putting weight on your horse. We want to have been doing this two months ago, getting your horse prepped for the winter time. Um, but you can see here, oats and rice bran has several, similar amounts of calories. Beet pulp and alfalfa have less calories, but oil has about four times the amount of calories or energy than any of these other ingredients. So a little over two measuring cups a day for 60 days, and you can gain about 40 to 50 pounds uh, on a horse. Again, it's easier to do this when they're not freezing cold, trying to maintain their body weight. Uh, I've showed this over the years. People like this. It's a comparison of the DAC oil to a boatload of different oils that are out there looking at the fat content. They all have exactly the same amount of fat, and they all have exactly the same amount of calories. But why else do we feed oil? Well, oftentimes we're looking at the omega-3 fatty acid content. Don't look at the ALA. Don't look at a product that's just advertising a, the omega-3s. You want to talk about the omega-3s that actually do something. Are they advertising DHA or EPA? Because they're the omega-3s that actually do something. Um, uh, and the DAC oil has about 1.2% DHA, which comes from the small amount of fish oil that we put in there. But it is significantly higher than some of these other supplements that actually sell themselves as omega fatty acid supplements. We really just market this as a weight gain coat shine. Um, 
we have 4,000 IUs of natural vitamin E and we are NASC approved. The bloom, um, the question comes often, bloom versus oil, when do I do which? The bloom, I say, fixes damaged hair, hair quality. Uh, the oil will fill this little fat gland which lubricates the hair shaft. So the oil will make your horse really shiny, but the bloom has zinc and methionine and biotin and that will fix damaged hair. So biotin plays a huge role in skin and hair integrity and it will fix brittle, dry hair. November, last month, we talked about brood mares and, and a lot of the territory managers has, uh, had asked me to specifically touch on lighting and anything new in brood mares. Um, so I always start out with, well, what's the ideal body condition score? Um, and if she's between a, an eight or a nine, so she's really fat, then that's going to impair hormones and impair cycles, poor rebreeding, um, increase our risk for laminitis and have poor oocyte quality. If you do happen to get her pregnant, reduce fetal growth and higher predisposition to disease. So before you even think about getting her pregnant, you want to get her in a better body condition, not too thin, not too fat. Um, mares that are too fat or have this metabolic issues, insulin resistance, um, they have a lot of small medium follicles that never develop into that large follicle that's going to rupture and allow the oocyte to meet with the sperm so that we can create an embryo and, and a potential pregnancy. So if we never get develop that dominant follicle, then these mares are never going to get pregnant. We talked about lights. Uh, lighting is a common way to trick the mare into um, speeding up or, or start hastening the, the cycling. So 60 to 90 days prior to uh, when mares would normally cycle. Uh, so we're looking at, you know, two to three months prior to when she would normally start cycling um, to turn lights on. It will take about 30 to 45 days for mares to make the transition and an additional 20 to 30 days for them to go through that first heat cycle. Beginning a lighting program in late November to early December should allow for a late February breeding, which is really hastening it, especially if you're living in the northern uh, climates where it, the daylight is shorter for a lot longer because it's really daylight, uh, not temperature, that uh, indicates to the mare that she should start cycling. So some new research that has come out, again, with those omega-3, the algae or marine-derived omega-3 fatty acids. And this one was looking at uterine involution. So you have a mare, she's had a foal. Now, how quickly can we get that uterus to go back to its pre-pregnancy shape um, so that it's ready for being pregnant again? So we, we need to speed that process up. And horses are pretty good at that, pretty, pretty good. We can, feed, we can usually breed them on that full heat, unlike other animals. But if we can speed that up even further, um, that's going to give us a higher success rate of getting mares pregnant that have, have had a, have a full left foot. So the study was looking at feeding um, DHA from algae, which is like our DHA perform, and does it have an effect on follicular dynamics and uterine involution? So how fast can we get the uterus to snap back? Um, and the supplement, the, the mares that were supplemented with DHA during pregnancy um, had a significant increase, uh, de I should say decrease in the time it took for their uterus to snap back. Um, so, in summary for those brood mares, the DAC metabolic, again, where you we're going a little off label, but for body weight, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, if we can correct those hormonal issues, then we can decrease those issues effect on her not getting pregnant. The Breeder's Choice Plus is the ideal breeding um, vitamin and mineral supplement. And then either the DHA Perform or the Breeders Excel is also really high in that uh, omega-3 fatty acid, the DHA, to help with ovarian function, uterine involution, and rebreeding. So 
Any questions? I know that we have packed a whole lot in and we've gone longer than a normal webinar, but let me go back through. I've got a bunch of questions people asked here. Oh. Um. Okay. Use the 14 day regimen of rescue aid pace on my senior gelding based on some feedback feedback from an earlier webinar and it did wonders to help his hind end issues and loose stool. Fantastic. So for those with a horse with chronic diarrhea, we do recommend, I recommend a 14 days, one tube a day of the rescue aid pace has been super successful for correcting um, that, uh, that diarrhea. And another comment that the metabolic works great on broodmares for milk production. That's fantastic. That's what we've seen in, in dairy cows. So that's great. Um, prolonged case of white line disease lasting over years. The horse owner is doing everything possible to treat it and has multiple barriers working on the horse to try and remedy this. Is there anything nutritionally that could be helpful? Well, number one, making sure they're on a balanced vitamin and mineral supplement. Number two, the first nutritional supplement I go to is the DAC DDA. If we can get the, the hindgut to function properly and them to get all the nutrients they can out of the food you're already feeding them, that can go a long way right there. And then um, onto the foundation formula. Um, when do you stop using the cult grower? Can you feed it past two years if they're still growing? Absolutely. Keep feeding it as long as you think your horse is still growing. Most horses, most you know, quarter horses, thoroughbreds are going to stop growing around two years of age. But if you think your horse is still growing, then continue feeding it. There is absolutely no problem feeding it longer than that. Um, I have a horse with a puncture wound. Oh, um, on the left hawk, we've had him on CMZs and Butte and, and all kinds of wound care. Today, he was very lame. He hasn't been... Um, Oh, and going back to butte, and would yucca or herbal respond be beneficial while trying to wean off the butte? Yes, and also put him on the cool gut because we know long-term butte is going to affect his stomach. Um, horse with EPM on the E natural, do you keep feeding it for the rest of their life or can you back off some? Um, usually a horse with equine protozole, my myoencephalitis or EPM, um, I do keep them on the natural, e natural long term. Um, I usually, when they're sick at first and showing a lot of symptoms, have them on a very high dose of natural vitamin E, but then get them down to what I call a maintenance dose, one scoop a day, which is 2,000 IUs of our e natural. This person swears by the yucca. I started my mare on it years ago um to get her off butte after sickness that caused laminitis then found her i would suggest adding the yucca with butte my best stress not to combine butte with devil's core um yes we did if you uh, we did find something about that on um the and we wrote about it in the dac dealer page we can get back to you on that lindsay i have multiple horses with insulin resistance and cushings we have Currently have them on insulin wise and percent. We plan to start adding metabolic soon. How soon after adding it can we wean off the other medication or if all? Um, I would keep them on the percent uh, under veterinary recommendation for a while until the vet has done more blood tests to see where their insulin is. But the insulin wise, uh, once you put them on the DAC metabolic, you can take them off the insulin wise. I have a customer that firmly believes in feeding E. However, a clinician convinced them that it had to be liquid. How do I convince them otherwise? That is a great question. So vitamin E is a fat-soluble vitamin. It is absorbed through fat-soluble receptors, and it gets stored in the fat. That's how nature designed it to work, because in the but vitamin E comes from fresh green grass, and there's no green grass in the, the summer and in the winter. Um, so they have to be able to store it in their fat and use it later. What the liquid vitamin E does is it, knowing that the fat soluble vitamin is stored, there's not a bunch of fat soluble vitamin receptors because you're going to absorb it and then you're going to store it. Water soluble vitamins are not stored. They're absorbed constantly every day. It's things like B vitamin. So 
what the water soluble vitamin E does is it changes the structure so that that vitamin E can utilize the water soluble channels. It's not being stored as well, but it will increase immediate absorption faster. Um, but long term, it's not a good option because they're meant to be storing it in the fat. So if you've got a horse that is severely, severely deficient, um, then I would agree that one to two weeks of the water soluble, but then I would get them off it because they're not going to be storing it as well as when they're using the um, vitamin E that is in the powdered form that is going to be stored in the fat. What about leveling out hormones, ovaries in the performance horse that I don't plan on breeding? Uh, the mare relief, people have used that quite successfully. Cool gut not advised for pregnant mares. No, pregnant mares can be on the cool gut. Uh, do you just feed the DHA or is it in addition to the breeder's choice when planning on rebreeding on fall heat? The breeder's choice plus is the vitamin and mineral supplement and the DHA perform is the omega-3. So you'd have to feed the both of them if you wanted to rebreed on this. Yes. Um, it's amazing to see the results from the e-boost and the electro aid when a horse has or is training to tie up always to have on hand. That's great. Um, for hard to breed mares uh, with clean cultures, etc., how do you choose between Breeders' Choice Plus and Breeders' Excel? You don't che choose between them. You feed them both. Breeders' Choice Plus, like I said, is a vitamin and mineral supplement, and Breeders' Excel is a um, omega-3 fatty acid supplement. So the two that are the same are the Breeders' Excel and the DHA Perform. The DHA Perform is just straight DHA. The Breeders' Excel is DHA and vitamin E. Um, but the Breeders' Choice Plus is a vitamin and mineral supplement. You always feed that or DAC Orange, whichever vitamin and mineral supplement your program uses. And the Breeders' Excel or the DHA Perform is an omega-3 fatty acid supplement that is in addition. Uh, yucca and Equiox safe to use together? Yes. Wow. We had a boatload of people on. That is absolutely fantastic. I'm stoked when I see uh, a lot of numbers. Hopefully this was useful. I'm sorry that we have to blow through a lot of the topics, but um, if you want any more information on any of the topics, go to the YouTube channel. We've got years worth of webinars loaded on that YouTube channel, and you don't always need to see the pictures. You can just play it and listen to it like a podcast. Um, Maybe that's something that we can look at in the future with one of these young whippersnappers that are coming up the ranks in the DAC company. We can do a podcast. Okay, any other questions? Well, again, I would reiterate uh, that days is one of the most fun meetings that I attend as a speaker. I know that we've got some great speakers coming. Um, please, if you've never been before, it's a great event to come to. If you're a dealer and you want to go to the next level, it, it is a way to see what other people are doing um, and just just be around people that are being very successful in the company, learn great new things, network. It's just a fun thing to go to. If anybody on the phone, I know you guys can't type in. If you guys have questions, unmute yourself and uh, we can take your call, take your question. Anybody? Okay. Well, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, all of that. Stay safe. Um, we'll be back in January with another webinar. Um, keep on being great. Thank you.